Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us today to hear about green finance and climate risk mitigation in India, which is such an important topic, not just for India, but also for the rest of the world, given the size of India's population and economy. I'm Maxine Nelson from the Gart Risk Institute and I will be your host today. Before we start, I'll give you some tech tips. Now, if your screen freezes, press F5 to refresh. For any technical difficulties, you can troubleshoot by clicking on the yellow help icon on the bottom of your console. You can type any questions into the Q&A box and download slides by clicking on the green page icon on your console. You can also resize any windows by holding down and dragging the bottom right hand corner. So now let's get onto the main event. First, I'm going to hand over to IIBF for some introductory comments. Over to you, Sumya. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Maxine. Hi, I'm Soumya. I uh, from uh, Indian Institute of Banking and Finance. Just a brief introduction about the two institutions. Uh, needless to say about IIBF, it was established in 1928, uh, and IIBF has emerged as a premier institute in banking and finance education for those employed as well as those seeking employment. IIBF offers a bouquet of courses which cater to varied levels of management in banks. It has been continuously reinvesting itself by offering diverse and contemporary subjects in the banking and finance domains. This has helped the industry professionals to sustain their professionalism through continuing professional development. The Global Association of Risk Professionals, GARP, is a nonpartisan, not for profit membership organization focused on elevating the practice of risk management. GARP offers the leading global certification for risk managers, the Financial Risk Manager, which is the FRM, and the Sustainability and Climate Risk Certificate. It also offers ongoing educational opportunities through continuing professional development. IIBF and GARP have collaborated to offer the Financial Risk and Regulations course, that is the FRR of GARP, to IIBF members. As a part of this collaboration and IIBF's member education series, a contemporary topic has been organized by both the institutions for spreading awareness amongst the bankers. One of today's webinar is Green Finance and Climate Risk Mitigation in India. As I'm, I'm sure many of you are aware that India has the second largest population uh, in the world and according to the UN it's expected to surpass China's population within the next year. It's also one of the world's largest economies. And so after decades of population growth and economic development, even though India's per capita emissions are very low, India is now the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. Now on the mitigation side, India has added a lot of clean energy capacity over the last several years in support of its, of its Paris Agreement pledge, which now ranks it third in the world for total renewable energy that's been added and while many organizations in India have taken steps towards achieving net zero, there's still a lot more work to be done to support carbon reduction and climate risk mitigation. Now, this is important because not only is it now having a large impact on the climate, but India is also among the countries that are most vulnerable to climate change due to its geography and the dependence on agriculture. So we're very fortunate that we've got these esteemed speakers today to give us insights into the current thinking. So we're going to start with a regulatory perspective, move on to an economic perspective, and then I'll take a step back to the global perspective, and then we'll, we'll open up the floor to, to your questions. So to start, to start today's thought-provoking discussion, we'll start with the regulatory perspective. And I'm very pleased uh, that we have with us today to speak Mr. Sunil Nair, who's the Chief General Manager in the Department of Regulation at the Reserve Bank of India. He has a long distinguished career as a central banker with a wide range of experience in policy and regulation. Uh, and he's uh, worked at the Reserve Bank in many different capacities. So uh, over to you, Sunil, for your insights. Thank, thanks a lot. Uh, am I audible? <clears throat> yes. Yeah, uh, a very good morning and good evening to my co-panelists and participants, depending on the, the whichever part of the world the, where they're joining in. Uh, 
Firstly, I would like to thank uh, IIBF and GAP for giving me an opportunity to be a part of this webinar on green finance and climate risk mitigation in India. Climate risk and sustainable finance have been engaging attention of regulators, national authorities, and supranational authorities the world over. There is also now a growing realization that climate change financial risk pose both micro and macro crew concerns. In view of this, as you are already aware, Reserve Bank of India set up a sustainable finance group in the Department of Regulation, which I am heading in May 2021, to effectively look at the uh, aspects relating to the risk emanating from climate, as also to lead the regulatory initiatives that can be taken in these areas. Further, to learn from the global, uh, uh, learn and contribute to the global efforts, Reserve Bank of India became member of Na Network for Greening Financial uh, for Financial System as a member in April 2021. We are also part of various other regulatory board bodies like Basel Committee on Banking Supervision, Financial Stability Board, International Platform on Sustainable Finance, to name a few. And we have been contributing in our own way to these uh, international standard setting bodies or international organizations, and we are trying to learn from them. In this endeavor, as you're already aware, in Reserve Bank of India came out with a discussion paper on climate risk and sustainable finance on July 27, 22. The discussion paper, like other central banks across the world, focuses on aspects like governance, strategy, risk management, disclosures, scenario analysis, stress testing, and stuff like that. Additionally, we carried out a survey of the scheduled commercial banks across the uh, across the country, uh, the leading 34 scheduled commercial banks in India, which was carried out in the beginning of the year. We published a survey report also, which gives us insights of what is the thinking of the Indian commercial banks vis-a-vis -vis climate risk and sustainable finance. So put these th things together, the discussion paper as well as the survey has given us an insight. The discussion paper is open for comments till September 30, 2022. We, 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 we would appreciate the, uh, the, Fred, the stakeholders as well as other members who are interested to go through this paper and give their valuable comments and input so that it will help us in taking lead a, 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 as far as the initiatives which can be taken in this direction. Now trying to give a little bit of flavor in terms of like what is happening globally in terms of growth or, and development of green financial products and the markets and how is it supporting the achievement of net uh, zero goals. Now it's a map it, it, it's uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to talk from the perspective of the regulated entities which we are regulating, that is banks, non-bank financial corporation, uh, companies and financial institutions. The regulatory, the regulatory entities on their own cannot bring about a drastic change, but they can definitely do, do a little bit on their side to help the clients and help them achieve the net zero transition, net easing. Now, if you are to look at globally, some of the banks like JP Morgan, Bank of America, HSBC, City Bank, Stancy have set ambitious financing targets in billions of dollars over 10 years from 2021 to 2030 to help address climate change and contribute to sustainable development. In recent years, like global banks have come out with varied kind of products, be green deposits, green loans, sustainability, sustainability linked loans, and stuff like that. In India, closer home, if you have to look at Many of the banks in India have started offering green deposits. They have started offering green loans. They have started offering sustainability linked loans. And the entire endeavor here is to achieve that net zero goal is a target. Now, if you look at the bond market in 2021, I think the sustainable bond issuance was US dollar one trillion, with a, which was spearheaded by the green bond issuance, and which, which saw a 20x rise from 2015 and accounted for 10% of the global debt market. To walk the talk globally, banks have set net zero targets, and so has been the case in India. Some of the banks like State Bank of India, HDFC Bank, and Yes Bank have taken the lead by announcing the net zero targets like 2030, 31, and 32. Globally, some of the banks have joined alliances like Net Zero Banking Alliance and Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. So I would like to add here that these entities definitely, financial ent sector definitely has a key role to play in financing transition to net zero world. And the growth and development of green financial products and markets would definitely help in supporting the achievement of net zero goals. 
coming to the second part, like what are the perceptions of green investments among the Indian banking sector? I think, as I told, uh, alluded a little earlier, we carried out a survey of the 13, 34 scheduled commercial banks in India, which gave us insight as to what they think about climate risk and sustainable finance, and what is their thought process in terms of the products that can be offered on the liability side as well as the asset side. Most of the banks have indicated that they would try to reduce the exposure to carb high carbon emitting or polluting businesses in coming years. They are also looking in terms of tapping the opportunities for climate change, and some of them have already launched green deposits to raise resources. Some of them have started offering sustainability-linked loans. And in this endeavor, some of the banks have started looking at the capacity building exercise because there is a need for the adequate personal uh, need for personal with specific skills who can understand climate risk and try to uh, capture that when they are trying to um, lend or invest. They are also looking at from the disclosure perspective. Now, having said so, Reserve Bank of India has done a lot. May, may not be in uh, directly uh, uh, related to climate risk, because in India we have a concept of priority sector lending, where they they get they are allowed to lend to renewable projects, lend for installation of standalone solar agriculture pumps and agriculture uh, solar power plants and stuff like that. And the numbers here indicate that outstanding bank credit for renewable energy sector under priority sector lending had grown from 1,315 crore as of June 19, 2022, 3868 crore as on June 17, 2022. In India, FDI up to 100% is allowed in the renewable energy sector under automatic route without any prior approval. With an encouraging policy framework, the year 2021 saw a sharp increase in renewable energy investment in India with investments of US dollar 18.8 billion in renewable energy. That is about 3x investments in 2020. So, as a whole, banks are looking to reduce the exposure to carbon emitting or polluting business, and they are trying to adopt gradual and non-disruptive transition approach to transition away from such business, keeping in mind the developmental imperatives of the country. Now, coming to the aspect as to what are the challenges and the opportunities which Indian banks face, face again, our survey gave us insights in terms of three major concerns there. Availability of skilled human resource is an issue. Inadequate data is an issue. There are difficulties in measurement of climate risk. Though some of the banks have started setting up a separate, most of them are not set up a separate business unit or a vertical, but they are looking at from their perspective. They are yet to integrate climate risk into the risk management framework. Now, having said so, India does not have a taxonomy of its own. Like globally, you have Europe as well as China has a taxonomy of its own. India doesn't have a taxonomy of own. It's a work in progress. So once that is in place, I think it will get, get a lot of boost. Now, coming to some of the specific initiatives which India has taken, like as you're already aware, on August 3rd, 2022, the Union Cabinet has approved India's updated national dis determined contributions, and it now uh, is committed to reduce the emission intensity of its GDP by 45% by 2002 30 from 2005-11 and achieve 50% of cumulative electric power installed capacity from non-fuel fuel based energy resources by 2030. Now, achieving, the, achieving these targets is a huge kind of uh, uh, task and everybody has to pitch in, be it financial investment in institutions or be it markets, they will have to do a lot. So, they, they, that is again a work in progress, but I already highlighted that there are certain issues with banks have are facing in terms of capacity building, in terms of measurement and stuff like that. Now, in terms of the quantum of amount, I think Council on Energy, Environment, Water did a recent study where they estimated that India would need 10 trillion to achieve net zero by 2070. And this would span across sectors like power, industry, and transport sectors. And they had estimated that there would be a shortfall of investment of 3.5 trillion for this net zero ambition. Banks can definitely play a vital role in this regard. They have been taking initiatives, they have been taking lead, but more needs to be done in this area. Now, coming to the another aspect as to where does India stand in terms of uh, scenario analysis and stuff like that, I would like to highlight the fact that in the discussion paper, we have a specific aspect where we have highlighted as to what is the bank's take as far as scenario analysis and stress testing is concerned. Where do they stand, and what are the what 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 are their 
thoughts or what what is their take on that view the expected feedback from their end reserve bank of india is internally trying to assess as to how to do the scenario analysis and look and we are looking at european central bank bank of england and others other central banks who have done a lot of work in that area and taking a cue from that we will be definitely taking it forward because we have given as a part of commitment to ngfs that scenario analysis would be one aspect so we are definitely uh, that is definitely something which is on the radar but having said so we would expect the stakeholders to respond as to what are their views or what is their take on assessing and scenario analysis so to conclude i would say that banks and financial institutions are the backbone of india's economic growth and they they support in transition of real economy to net zero emission is well recognized as country pivots to a green future and sustainable growth the banks and fis will have to accelerate their focus on greening the indian financial system however having said so the challenge before us is to mainstream green finance think ways and means to incorporate climate risk and esg related considerations into commercial lending and investment decision while simultaneously balancing the needs of credit expansion economic growth and social development of the country climate risk and sustainable finance being an evolving area banks and financial institutions would do well to pay greater attention attention to the associated climate related financial risk and continuously develop their capabilities and expertise in this area i'll stop here thanks a lot Great, thank you. That was a, a fantastic uh, overview. You covered a lot of ground from so your recent publication to um, kind of where you're going in the future and the expectations for banks. So uh, one of my takeaways was that the expectations are continually increasing for both capacity building in banks and for banks to help mainstream green finance, and these challenges will continue. So I will um, now... Uh, I think Mr. Das hasn't yet rejoined us, so we will continue looking at the yeah. the next uh, aspect. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Am I oh yes, uh, Maxine, Mr. Das has joined. Oh great! Yeah, am okay. I, am I audible? Yes. Right. He has joined because of some connectivity issues, so you can see him and you can hear yes, him. Yes, we can see both of you. Great. So. Uh, I think you're, you're going to say a few words beforehand. So over to you to say a few words now before we go to the economic perspective. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks, Max. Actually, uh, this uh, this UN Climate Change Conference of the Parties (COP26) held at uh, Glasgow. So Reserve Bank of India is also assessing uh, the 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 by how to limit the global warming and likely to set more ambitious climate action plans for the Indian financial world. And he is in the forefront of all these activities done by this Reserve Bank of India. So in the words of UN Special Envoy for Climate Change and Finance, Mark Kearney, every professional decision taken climate change into account. That is where we stand now. And now in the, in the process, what has happened? Uh, it is not just the technology. The sustainability will be the key drivers to the growth in the future. So from the uh, goal of the every organization has to change from profit people, planet, to planet, people, and profit, the three Ps of the sustainable finance. So perhaps, Perhaps who is in a better position to decide on these uh, changes which will be happening to the financial sector other than Dr. Ghosh, uh, who is representing State Bank Group. And State Bank Group uh, manages close to 25% of the banking sector. And over to Maxim. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I think that was a fantastic introduction to, uh, to uh, as you say, to uh, Sumya Kanji Ghosh, who is uh, the, uh, the group. Uh, Chief Economic Advisor of the State Bank of India, and so that's a they account for such a large proportion of the the lending in India. And uh, Sumya has had a, a range of roles in other organisations as well. Uh, has been visiting faculty at a number of um, high-profile universities. Been involved in a lot of research. Uh, has been ranked in the top three by Bloomberg as a professional economist for currently predicting, sorry, correctly predicting predicting 
the future trajectory of macroeconomic variables. So I think it's going to be a, a fascinating um, uh, discussion that he's about to, to give us or insight into his views on the, the economic perspective of climate change in India. So over to you, Sumya. Thank you, and uh, thank you, and thank you, uh, uh, the, uh, both the institutes, for giving me an opportunity to speak on this topic. Although I will uh, uh, admit that I don't have I mean, don't have much expertise in this area, but I can give you some economic perspective, the way that things are moving, and the way uh, actually the numbers are stacked up. Uh, so uh, once again, I would like to thank both the IIBF and GARP for providing. Uh, this platform and this uh, great initiative in terms of understanding the uh, future of the green finance market in India and also globally. So, and just a small clarification, I think uh, 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 as we as in the, uh, as we are in a digital world, we keep continuously uploading our profile. So, my latest profile can be on LinkedIn. So, just for uh, a small update on that. So, having said that, let me now take you through the presentation. I'll uh, quickly go through the presentation and some numbers I would like to uh, share in front of you, which is actually very important. Uh, the first thing is that uh, the, if you look into the India's climate profile, uh, the, the total greenhouse emissions, excluding land uh, use, change and forestry was around 238.89 million in 2016. Per capita is around 1.96. Uh, in uh, 2016, but the world is around 6.55. The key emitting sectors in India is energy, transportation, and construction. If you look at the sector-wise con contribution, energy contributes 75%, so that is the largest, and agriculture around 14.3, and waste is 2.6. The key climate risk for India, and this actually has been a recurring phenomenon in Indian context. I think there has been floods, droughts, heat waves, cold waves, and cyclones, but as all of us know, I think the uh, Indian context also there has been the unseasonal rains in India has been a part uh, of the last couple of years. Uh, we have been getting rains when we are don't uh, the, when it is not scheduled, and we are getting rains when it is scheduled. So basically, this year of course the monsoon has been good, but this has been a recurring future. And the vulnerable sectors are agricultural, food, water, coastal, health, forest, and other natural ecosystems. So if I go to the next slide, uh, uh, please. Uh, the, uh, the India's average temperature has actually risen by around 0.7% during the last 117 years. So that's the number which all of us need to appreciate. By the end of the 20th century, there are projections which say that the average temperature of India could rise by around 4.4 degrees Celsius, uh, which is related to the recent past. By the end of 21st century, the frequency of occurrence of warm days and warm nights is projected to increase by a massive 55% to 70% respectively. And the frequency of summer heat waves over India is projected to be three to four times higher by the end of the 21st century. So I think all these numbers show that there is the climate change in India is actually an issue which we have to deal with. If, and this is an issue which I think all countries are dealing with right now. We are witnessing one of the worst droughts in uh, parts of the Europe. And I think no country is immune to such climate change. And that is going to want get more uh, uh, severe as we progress towards the 21st century. Uh, next slide is basically... Uh, the, uh, some of the uh, changes, for example, the Indian washroom, I will again give some numbers over here. The sea surface temperature, for example, that is in by one degree Celsius, there has been changes in rainfall. Uh, the summer monsoon precipitation of India has declined by around 6%. Uh, there has been droughts. I have said, said this in the beginning. And tropical cyclones also, there has been a significant reduction in the annual frequency of tropical cyclones. Uh, since the middle of the century, but very severe cyclonic storms have increased significantly during the last two decades. Uh, and this is actually an interesting phenomenon in the Indian context. In the last couple of years, we had severe cyclones in parts of in states like West Bengal. We have severe cyclones also in the states like Maharashtra. Uh, so basically, several parts of Orisha also. 
Tamil Nadu. So there are several parts of India. There has been uh, uh, the cyclone storms have uh, has increased significantly, and I think that is also a matter of concern. Now, if I go into the next slide, uh, this is a sector-wise emissions. Uh, as we can see that the CO2 emissions account for around 79%, methane emissions around 14%, and uh, Indian emission intensity of gross domestic product, however, has reduced by 24% between 2015 and 16. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, what is the transitional risk, the current policy trends? As all of us know, India is implementing the largest renewable energy expansion program in India. So there is uh, and more than... 366.7 billion LED bulbs, LED tube lights, and energy efficient funds have been distributed under the Ujala scheme. This is a paid scheme of the government of India. The street lighting national program, more than 11.25 million LED street lights have been insta installed. This basically due to the demand for electricity in general. And this FAME program, the first adoption and manufacturing of electric vehicles, India has actually gone into some sort of an overdrive in terms of adoption of electric vehicles since April 1, 2015. The scheme has actually, it's taking off. It's, it's a slow progression in a developing country like India, given the infrastructural concepts. But this is basically, and one of the risks over here is the technology risk and the safety of the battery. And there have been some instances whereby there has been instances of battery fire. But this is one area where India is actually progressing very fast. Next is the direct impact on banks. Uh, if you look into the uh, the uh, uh, sector-wise fossil fuel intensity by sectors, the cement sector actually accounts for around 29%. And the share of the electricity generation in outstanding bank credit was at 7.5% in March 2020. This number has not moved up significantly. As all of you know, that 2021 was a year of pandemic. And 2022, this figure has marginally gone up. And there exists a wide variation in across states in terms of banking sector exposure to these sectors. Uh, the, the direct exposure of the banking sector to the three fossil fuel industries is not alarming. However, the, uh, the com because the combined share of electricity generation, chemical and automobile, is only around 10% for public sector banks, around 9% for private banks. So if you look to the direct impact on banks, it is not that significant at this point of time. Now, if we go into the next slide, the sector which have high input, I have said cement, basic metals, paper, and textiles. There is a closely need to closely monitor also the industries that have low interest coverage ratio. So, and high GNP ratio and high energy input intensity to prevent spillover to banks. This is one interesting conservation which you need to have. Now, what are the green finance project and risk? I will have some numbers. If we have time, we'll discuss the, uh, the numbers when we have the discussion, when the question answer session. Uh, investment of around 10 trillion is required to achieve net zero by 2070. There are some estimates which says that India requires 17.8 trillion to attain net zero level. There are estimates by industry association which said that India could require around US 20 billion uh, worth of investment every year to achieve its climate targets. India's climate action are largely financed from domestic sources. However, uh, technology transfer remains a pressing issue. So I think the fund requirements for transition to net zero is a humongous number. There are different estimates. I have also some other estimates in front of me. Uh, uh, but one number I would like to point out, which is not in the slide, is that emerging markets needs allowed US 95 trillion to help them transition to a net zero economy by 2060. And India requires around 17.8 trillion for the purpose, as, as I said. Now, so this is a huge number. So next, if you... Uh, Next, if we just look at the green finance taxonomy, I'll not get into all this. It's a social bonds, sustainability bonds, sustainability lean bonds, transition bonds, green bonds. So basically, these are all slides. And what are the impact on banding? Social bonds could be a role in housing. Sustainability, sustainability lean bonds could be overlap with banks' lending policy. Transition bonds could be a bank of the bank, non SLR portfolio, green bonds. So there are several great bonds which could be uh, used. And I have just given an example. Uh, next slide is basically on the non-budgetary resources uh, uh, of the green finances. As part of the green finance, I think this was just discussed. I'll just take around two minutes more. The Reserve Bank had included the small renewable sector under the priority sector lending in 2015. This figure is going back as of today. The number is around 365 billion. 
So if you divide it by 80, you'll get the corresponding US billion figure. India has started green bonds since 2015. In 2021, India issued 6 billion of green bonds. Most of the green bonds since 2015 have maturity is five years and above. The cost of issuing green bonds in India has remained on the higher side. But the important thing is that green bonds are used by the public sector units in India corporates with better financial health. And this is one trend which has been slowly picked up in India. Thanks also to the RBI initiative, whereby it has pushed it under the priority sector lending scheme. Uh, next is basically the opportunities in India, green hydrogen, renewable energy projects, electric vehicles, city gas distribution and ethanol blending. These are all 5 million, 500 gigahertz, uh, electric vehicles, city gas distribution, ethanol blending. These are all opportunities for the green finance in India. And I think these are very significant in the next five years. You can all see that the target in there has already achieved the target of ethanol blending ahead of the schedule. And in the next, I think by eight years, the target which the Indian government has set are very ambitious in terms of the green finance opportunities. Uh, what are the other risks over here? I think there is a risk, as all of you know, is of counterparty risk, uh, basically payment delays. Infrastructure risk is one of the risks in a developing country like India. Generation risk could be there, investment risk could be tariff bidding, competition with global investor, construction risk, commodity risk, as all of us know that the commodity cycle has become very volatile. Uh, and the supply side risk, basically customs duty on solar models, given the fact that we are increasingly being embroiled in an economy or in a global economy, whereby protectionism is the order of the day. So, uh, and finally, if you look at the electric vehicles, the infrastructure risk is one of them, adequate availability of charging points, the, third, the fire risk, uh, the alternatives are CNG-based vehicles, risk of grid overload, technology risk, ethanol bending, also there are risk, which is supply risk, regulatory risk, and safety hazard. So there are risks uh, which actually talks about all these things. Uh, then in terms of the other green finance risk, uh, other is basically if you look into the city gas distribution or the sourcing of gas, the domestic gas sometimes is not sufficient. Import dependency is result in price and foreign exchange risk. There's the project execution risk. Uh, the skill manpower, the inventory management, uh, which is very, clearly, very critical for consistent supply. There is also the regulatory risk. For example, priority in domestic supply of gas and pricing for CGD, multiple clearances are required. Green hydrogen also, uh, there is this production cost, uh, transportation and storage cost, nascent stage infrastructure risk. I think all this green finance, which India has a very ambitious opportunity, there are risks involved but of course there are significant opportunities which we can which i'll just slowly say going forward uh next i think uh, the what is the regulatory landscape i think india has already joined the ipsf in october 19 the reserve bank have joined the ndfs in april 21 our discussion paper as the uh, on climate risk is already on the rbi website the sovereign green bonds are the part of the government overall borrowing program announced in this budget. I think this is a very good initiative. An IFSCA guidance framework on sustainable and sustainability linked lending by financial institution IFSC. So I think these are some of the emerging regulatory landscape. I think the government of India and the Reserve Bank of India are fully cognizant of how this green finance scape uh, architecture is going to evolve in the coming days, and they have been. Uh, they have been actually ahead of the curve in terms of being member of the associations, central bank associations, and also some regulatory policy changes, which is important to take this initiative forward. Uh, then also, there, but there are some issues of challenges, I think, uh, over here. Uh, there is an absence of an universal definition of green finance over here, to, which often results in green watching. The existing literature, there is a suggestion the reduction in the asymmetric information uh, uh, could pave the way towards sustainable long-term economic growth. This has always been the case in terms of some things which are important to us. Data sometimes is uh, important for integration with Bessel III. Methodological challenges to estimate the emissions in Indian context. Consumers' willingness to pay higher price for the green products. I think this is a very important point. Long-term nature of green source energy may aggravate masculinity mismatch for banks. There are relevant financial instruments 
there has to be a need to create promote instruments such as green equity green deposits accounts for example as all of you know in sbi we have a, i will talk about a little bit of sbi initiative the largest bank we have a system whereby you can walk into the bank in a green channel and withdraw money from there manpower training and multiple compliance requirements with many types of soft standards so these are issues and challenges uh, and as i have said to you also in the beginning of risk but the opportunities are also huge in this context uh, i will just uh, mention some of sbi experience in green financing before i stop we are the country's largest bank and these are the finance to real energy sector in the world these numbers are in rupees crore so this in rupees billion should be around uh, 197 to solar total we have invested around 324 domestic rupees billion so uh, uh, the around us 4 billion is the total sbi finance to real energy sector in india there are lines of credit the world bank 620 million 480 rooftop solar projects have been sanctioned the german development bank has done 177.3 million uh, us dollar 277 billion supporting energy efficient housing projects in fact we are also a part with the world bank in this grid connected rooftop solar projects in india and the european investment bank which is uh, the, which has given out 214.3 million uh, supporting grid connected solar pv projects so i think these are uh, some of this important credit which are being given for supporting green projects and the sbi is also a stakeholder in some of these lines of credit at least with the world, at least as I understand with, uh, for example, with the World Bank is concerned. Uh, finally, uh, uh, sorry, uh, finally, uh, SBI in green financing, we have adopted a green bond framework. We have made three issuances of green bond aggregating US 800 million since 2018. So we're already over there. SBI has decentralized a processing cell to process all the loan application for solar projects as well as household. This is one area where we are very aggressive. We have also given mandate to e-rickshaw scheme. So that's actually an initiative towards e uh, 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 environmental friendly mode of transport. And finally is that we are financing solar pump sets. Solar pumping systems serve as easy to use, cost effective and sustainable alternatives to conventional pumps. So to end over here, I think uh, the, I think this is a new area, the green financing in the Indian context. But I can tell you that uh, the Indian regulatory infrastructure, the Reserve Bank of India, the government of India, as also the commercial banks are getting more accustomed to this transition to a uh, green economy in the next five years. I think some of the targets till 2030 are very aggressive. But beyond that, I think the important point is that the mobilization of funds for that purpose, the numbers which I have quoted is that India needs around US 17.8 trillion and the emerging markets new around 95, 95 trillion. So that's some numbers which we have to work with and to see that we are able to achieve our targets in accordance with the global best practices. Thank you. I will end here. Thank you. There were some huge numbers in there uh, about the amount of investment that's needed. And then another huge number in there that struck me was uh, the amount of LED bulbs that have been given out, more than $360 million. Uh, So I think that um, feeds on the previous um, discussion from Mr Nair about the opportunities here and the um, the amount of work that... Uh, is available the amount of lending that is needed for for financing green. I'm now going to take a step back and look at the global perspective and some of the, the key themes we're seeing in risk management globally. Now, uh, the last uh, four years, we've conducted a survey of financial risk management uh, globally and I'm going to tell you some of the findings of the 2021 survey, which covered 78 major financial firms from around the world. And we looked at different aspects like governance, strategy, their risk management, metrics, targets and limits, scenario analysis, and then how they disclose that information externally. And one of our kind of our key findings or key things that, that maybe not shouldn't be so much of a surprise, was that the tone is set from the top. So the majority of firms have C-level accountability for climate risk. 
And uh, for most banks, for example, and insurance companies, we found that the chief risk officer is most commonly the senior person who's responsible for climate risk management. So it's being seen, climate change is being seen as a risk um, a risk topic and is being, uh, the accountability sets at the very highest levels within a risk function. But boards are discussing a whole range of topics as this chart shows. So climate change itself is the most common topic which is being discussed by boards followed by net zero or portfolio, portfolio alignment, looking at transition risks, uh, but they're also looking at strategic risks and opportunities and looking also at, for example, the physical risks of their own operations. So boards are engaged across a big range of topics. Now we also saw that more firms are expecting significant strategic risks and opportunities uh, compared to previous years. And we also saw that the proportion of firms that are anticipating a significant impact on their strategy continues to rise as we look in the future. And we particularly see this over the next five years. But banks and firms are still expecting to have big impacts on their strategic risks and opportunities over long time scales. And then as part of assessing which aspects of your business need reviewing, you know, firms need to understand which type of climate risk is expected to have the largest impact on their business. So we asked which of the, the risk types, transition, physical, or portfolio alignment are our highest priority. And the firms told us that transition risk, it was the most the highest priority in most firms, followed by alignment and then physical risks. So if we add up all the pieces of this pie, there were 87% of firms noted that transition risk was their highest priority, 71% alignment and 47% physical risk. However, we also saw that these risks are equally significant at about a third of firms. Now, whilst firms are starting looking at the risks, most firms don't believe yet that climate risks are fully incorporated into market pricing. We saw that just 6% of firms think that it's priced correctly, and that was similar to the previous year. Now, firms uh, felt that those, those firms that did feel the pricing was at least partially reflected into prices said that was in a few areas, such as emerging market sovereign bonds, green bond prices, or a few lines of insurance. Now, we know that you know, for accurately pricing risks and opportunities is really important uh, and it's going to be more important in the future because, you know, as you know, good risk management is all about getting sufficient return for the risks that you're running. So this is an area that um, we're hoping to see being more evolved and, and the pricing of these risks actually being factored more into the products that are being sold. So that was a kind of a quick run through of some of our main findings. Now we're actually releasing the next survey on the 13th of September, so in about a month's time, that was conducted this year. And um, you, you could also find on our website uh, a case study about kind of some of the trade-offs um, in India, trade-offs between the climate mitigation and adaptation. And most of the perspective I just discussed was about the impact of the climate on the balance sheet or the bank's profitability. Now, we often speak here about understanding which perspective you're interested in before you do any work. And the need to understand the perspective was reinforced in a recent piece of work we did with 50 banks around the world in conjunction with UNFFI, looking about at the what information a board should see. And this was quite interesting that we found a clear way to present the information is to separate it into balance sheet related and own operations where you own operations, the emissions from your buildings, the power consumed and the travel. And then the balance sheet risks were further separated into categories like climate risk management, the actual impact on the balance sheet, portfolio alignment, regulatory risks. So this kind of reinforces the messaging that you need to understand which perspective you're looking at. But these days, more and more banks are looking at these multiple perspectives as their understanding and the investigation of climate risk grows. So with that step back to the kind of the global perspective, I'm now going to, to 
uh, move on to the audience questions. And we've had questions coming in throughout. So I'm going to ask, I think, the first one to Mr. Nair, because we've had a few different permutations of questions about scenario analysis and stress testing. Uh, and uh, when is the Reserve Bank going to start looking at those topics? Uh, and what are the expectations for banks? So over to you to give us some views on that. Yeah, thanks. Thanks. Uh... Um, thanks. Uh, uh, I think I already alluded earlier that as far as uh, scenario analysis and stress testing is concerned, globally, if you look at, I think, European Central Bank, Bank of England, and a couple of other central banks have done on it. Most of the NGFS has told in terms of the scenarios. We are closely looking at the scenario analysis part and trying to work in their direction, but it is early stages as of now, so I, should, I would not be able to talk much on that. But we expect that the market participants or stakeholders comment on the aspect of the scenario analysis and stress testing as what is their view on it. Of course, globally, there are different models there, top-down, bottom-up, static, dynamic. There are a lot of permutation combinations there. But we are closely examining it. We are looking at it. But, but we would want feedback from our stakeholders before we take it forward. Great. Great. Um... Thank you. So, yeah, I think all the, um, as you say, the, lots of the central banks are, are, are looking at kind of scenario analysis and stress testing and how best to implement it in a way that's meaningful for their jurisdictions. Um, while you're there, I might ask you, actually, there was another question about taxonomy. And I think you also did mention taxonomy when you spoke earlier. Uh, someone was, ask, was asking, could you give any more information about you know, taxonomy and are there plans to... Uh, develop or implement a taxonomy. I, I, I think that, thanks once again. I think taxonomy. If you look at globally, it is more of a country, a sovereign who drives the taxonomy, and not the central bank who drives the taxonomy. If you look at globally, so it, it is work in progress as of now. The the Ministry of Finance has had <laughs> set up a task force, and they are examining various aspects, and one, one among them was taxonomy. It's pretty much in advanced stage. So once the taxonomy is out, I think we, we, uh, everybody would know like what it's all about. But as of now, I, I think as far as central bank is concerned, we are awaiting the the uh, the for a uh, for the report to come out from the government of India in term in terms of what the taxonomy would be like. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask my next question. Uh... To, uh, to Mr. Ghosh. Um, there are a few questions here actually, I think, aimed at, aimed at the kind of the banks who are doing this side. And the question's about what, what are you seeing banks doing? I think people are looking for really concrete things to reach a net zero goal. And actually one question someone I think asked in relation to uh, what I was talking about portfolio alignment. So that, that's aligning a portfolio to either a net zero objective or a specific temperature objective, it might be one and a half or two degree or net zero. So, uh, yeah, a question to Mr. Ghosh then about uh, what, I guess, concrete actions uh, uh, is the state bank taking or are you seeing other banks taking to meet net zero? Yes, I think uh, the, the as we have said, uh, as we have said in the course of our presentation, I think we have already uh, been taken several initiatives in terms of the green financing as, uh, as some of the numbers which have already given in terms of some of the initiatives in Ericsson, the, the, the greater fuel initiatives, Ericsson initiatives and others. So the bank is already having laid out policy uh, for this transition risk. But the important point, I'll just give you, I think uh, uh, if you look into these, uh, the, what the bank is doing, Actually, we are uh, the, we have had around four billion exposure to green financing. So we are actually uh, uh, in solar, windmills, small hydro, biomass, waste to energy. So we are there in all the sectors in terms of an transition to a green energy, and we also have an, uh, 
system in place whereby that aspect of the risk is considered when we are lending to a particular entity. But having said that, I think banks, currently banks in India also feel uh, there could be some structural changes that could be required in the traditional lending and investment approach to support green financing. Uh, most private sector, public sector and foreign banks have actually indicated that there should be some amount of structural change which could happen and that's a continuous process. So that's point number two. The final, I think, uh, the, if you look into the recent RBI survey, which has been mentioned also by the regulator at the beginning, I think uh, the uh, whereby it was a, a survey was done in terms of understanding whether the banks are having an internal strategy, climate risk into their risk management framework. I think that number shows that the private banks, public sector banks and foreign banks are at different levels of perception. And that shows that it's a work in progress. So on the one hand, while banks like State Bank of India, which is basically the largest commercial bank in India, have already put in, have been, have put in place a system to mitigate and monitor the climate, the risk in this uh, the, the risk in lending. But I think we need to travel some distance as far as the entire banking system goes. Hopefully there are now talks of rating also entities in terms of these green ratings and other things. And if it comes through, I think we'll be in a better position to address this risk over a point of time. Because please note that the numbers which we have given in the next five years, the targeted numbers, which is there actually in my slide, are quite aggressive in the next four to five years. So we have to move towards this target. The financial system have to put in place a more structured and robust framework so that we are able to take this risk into proper perspective. Great, thank you. And I might ask you one question if we can have a short answer because I'm very conscious of time. So a question about basis points actually on green bonds. So we've had a few different questions about um, like basis point difference and why are we seeing a basis point difference on green bonds compared to non-green bonds. Um, can you give us a quick answer to that or is that not possible? No, I think regarding the green bonds, the only thing we have, we can see is that we have actually, the, the, there has been an, I mean, uh, uh, in the last, I think 2020 and also there has been a lot of green bonds have been issued. And hopefully I think as, as I said to you, the funding is going to be a major source in this context because the banks can actually do it up to a certain uh, level. So I think these uh, new instruments like bonds and other instruments, there could be some innovative pricing mechanism and innovative discovery also in the future because uh, to satisfy the funding needs, which is enormous in this context, uh, my sense is that we need to move beyond green bonds also at some point of time. So maybe next time when you come back, you can see some more initiatives which the banks are doing in terms of mobilizing in this uh, area. Great, fantastic. Actually, I'm going to draw the Q&A to a close. I, um, so I'm conscious of time. Um, we've had a lot of fantastic and questions. Just one second, if I just add, our bank already has a green bond framework. So that provides a roadmap regarding the green bond issuance. And uh, we have actually have a green bond portfolio also. So I think this is a very interesting area and uh, uh, maybe there could be more innovations in this area as you move forward. Great that we uh, can see you're leading by example, which is great. Uh, and as you as, um, think both, both of you, you've both said, there are tons of opportunities, like trillions of dollars of opportunities. So there are so many opportunities out there for um, bond issuance financing. And one of the things that I'm, I'm going to just touch on for a second uh, is that some of the questions also, and some of the discussion was about capability building. So. There are other um, resources available at GARP on our Sustainability and Climate Resource Hub of different topics. And then, of course, as was mentioned at the start, the Sustainability and Climate Risk Certificate uh, for people who want to, to dig in and get a, a solid foundation in this topic. So I'm now going to hand over to uh, Dr. Morella Darren to uh, say our, our final summing up uh, and, and vote of thanks. Yeah, uh, it was really a wonderful uh, uh, webcast, which was uh, jointly organized by the Indian Institute of Banking and Finance and by GARP. 
and uh, all of the all the participants uh, will agree that uh, the topic chosen on green finance and climate risk mitigation in india is uh, indeed a very contemporary topic not only in india but as uh, dr maxin said all over the world and uh, uh, we had excellent speakers uh, mr sunil uh, ts nayar uh, chief general manager from the reserve bank of india spoke from the regulatory perspective during the course of his uh, uh, presentation brief but a very insightful presentation he said about the discussion paper which rbi has released very recently which mm -hmm. included the survey of the banks and uh, he was categorically in saying that no regulatory entity can contribute unilaterally it is an effort to be taken by all the stakeholders by the by the regulators by the government by the banks by the people themselves by the companies and by all the stakeholders concerned otherwise uh, uh, achieving the net zero emission result will be a difficult task but then it's certainly not impossible but for the involvement of all the stakeholders he also said that uh the, uh the the renewable energy one of the major decisions taken by the reserve bank is in to include re uh, the renewable energy as part of under the priority sector lending of banks in india that's a very important concept where uh, 40% of the bank credit goes to certain specified sectors as uh, directed by the regulator and renewable energy is included in that very recently then uh, dr ghosh spoke about uh the the economic perspective when during his presentation he spoke about the climate profile india's position the climate changes which have been observed in india the temperature rise cyclones etc and he also mentioned that the investment for achieving zero risk net zero position is quite high it runs into several uh, trillion uh, us dollars and uh, he also spoke about the green finance emerging trends in india the opportunities and the emerging regulatory landscape besides highlighting the role which sbi has already taken in so far as green financing is concerned and then uh, dr maxin uh, nelson the chief representative uh, the, the senior vice president from the gap risk institute spoke from a global perspective uh, she mentioned about the building blocks about climate risk management transition risk is a priority for most firms climate risk are not being priced they should be done going forward and then she also shared an element of uh, dashboard for the banks after that we had some good insightful question answer session by the participants which was uh, extremely well moderated by uh, dr nelson so i would uh, think that there were very good takeaways from this webinar so on this occasion i on behalf of uh, the indian institute of banking and finance would like to thank mr nayar Dr. Ghosh and Dr. Maxine Nelson for sharing the valuable insights on the subject. Another word of appreciation, I'll be failing in my duty if I don't say that, is uh, for the representatives from GARP who provided all the technical clarifications regarding the platform. This platform was new, in so far as all of us were concerned, but we are made quite familiar with that. We had mock runs, so everything went off smoothly, and uh, the program was well coordinated. And uh, my own team. of uh, my people who worked tirelessly to ensure that the program is well received and well coordinated and last but not the least we got good participation from the participants and good insightful questions so i i i am a personal behalf and on behalf of indian institute of banking uh, banking and finance and gar wishes i mean thanks the thank we uh, like to thank once again the eminent speakers from rbi from garp institute and sbi dr ghosh for sharing their valuable insights on the topic thank you thank you once and all